Now it is time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alicia. And I just managed to turn off my cell phone just, just <laughs> as you were turning to me. Just in time. Just in time. I love it. Thanks, Have a Alicia. great night. Thank you very much. Reed Smoot was elected to the United States Senate in 1902. No voter ever saw his name on a ballot. Reed Smoot was elected to the Senate the old-fashioned way, the way the founders thought senators should be elected. The state legislature chose and voted for Reed Smoot to go to the United States Senate to represent the state of Utah. In his 30-year career as a senator, Reed Smoot rose to the most powerful chairmanship in the Senate, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, with jurisdiction over the federal government's two ways of raising revenue, bringing money into the Treasury, taxation and tariffs. With the stock market crashing in 1929 and the country entering the Great Depression, Reed Smoot had the worst idea any chairman of the Senate Finance Committee ever had. It was an idea that would end his career in the Senate. The House Ways and Means Committee had the same jurisdiction in the House that the Finance Committee has in the Senate, taxation and tariffs. The chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Willis Hawley, loved Reed Smoot's very bad idea. That idea also ended Chairman Hawley's career in the House of Representatives. In 1930, with the country sinking deeper into an economic depression, Chairman Smoot and Chairman Hawley pushed the Tariff Act of 1930 through their committees, and then they both got it passed in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and by the time it reached the President's desk for signature, it had come to be known as the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. It raised tariffs astronomically, higher than ever before, on thousands of goods. It was exactly what Donald Trump is now proposing as a presidential candidate. Economics was a much less uh, complex field of scholarship in 1930 than it is today. The analytical tools available to economists were far fewer and very unsophisticated compared to today. But even then, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs were something economists could agree on. Over a thousand economists signed a petition to President Herbert Hoover, Republican President Herbert Hoover, asking him to veto the Smoot-Hawley tariffs. America's most famous industrialist at the time, Henry Ford, knew it would be a disaster for business and, disa and a disaster for the economy. He went to the White House to try to convince the Republican President Herbert Hoover to veto the tariff bill written by Republican Senator Reed Smoot and Republican Congressman Willis Hawley and passed with overwhelming Republican support in the House and the Senate. Henry Ford called the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, quote, an economic stupidity. J.P. Morgan's chief executive said, quote, I almost went down on my knees to beg Herbert Hoover to veto the asinine Smoot-Hawley tariff. Herbert Hoover, a successful businessman in his own right, thought he knew better. And he signed the Smoot-Hawley tariffs into law. And in the next election, Herbert Hoover lost his re-election campaign for the presidency to the governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In that same election in 1932, when voters were living with the disaster of Reed Smoot's bright idea and Willis Hawley's eager support of that idea, Senator Smoot and Congressman Hawley lost their re-election campaigns. There is universal agreement among economists that Smoot-Hawley tariffs made the Great Depression even worse. Those tariffs did not protect American jobs. They killed American jobs. And, those, and, the, it, and it meant that the portrait of Willis Hawley hanging in the offices of the House Ways and Means Committee, along with the portraits of all the other chairmen of that committee, and the portrait of Reed Smoot, 
hanging in the offices of the Senate Finance Committee, along with the portraits of, the chair, of all the other chairmen of that committee, it meant that those portraits hang forever in disgrace and infamy. Smoot and Hawley hurt America more than any other chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee in history. They destroyed lives. People lost their homes, lost their jobs, lost their hope because of what Senator Smoot and Congressman Hawley did when they did not have any idea what they were doing, just like Donald Trump. And so when you hear economists now saying Donald Trump's idea about tariffs is even worse than Smoot and Hawley, you have to know something about Smoot and Hawley to really understand just how bad Donald Trump's idea is. Henry Ford would have to reach for a new rhetorical extreme to describe it because Henry Ford's phrase, an economic stupidity, would feel inadequate. Last week, Donald Trump said he wants to eliminate the tax code, eliminate the personal income tax and the corporate income tax, and replace the income tax with nothing but tariffs. Donald Trump wants to eliminate the income tax, replace the revenue to the government with nothing but tariffs, the biggest tariffs in American history. CNBC reports Donald Trump on Thursday brought up the idea of imposing an all-tariff policy that would ultimately enable the U.S. to get rid of the income tax, sources in a private meeting with the Republican presidential candidate told CNBC. Every Trump supporter who attends Trump's rallies believes Donald Trump's big lie when he says this. Nobody ever took money out of China like me. I took hundreds of billions of dollars out in the form of tariffs and taxes. Nope, he didn't take a penny from China, not one penny. It is reasonable to assume that most Trump voters believe that China pays the tariffs imposed by Donald Trump because Donald Trump says that China pays the tariffs. But in high school, they should have learned, and maybe before high school for a lot of students, they should have learned that tariffs are paid by the people in the country that imposes the tariffs. That's how tariffs work. You don't have to take advanced placement American history in high school to learn about tariffs, including the smoot Holly tariffs. Donald Trump knows that China does not pay the tariffs that he imposed. He knows that American consumers pay those tariffs. They function as sales taxes on American consumers. And Donald Trump is consciously lying when he says that to his audience about China paying the tariffs. And because American consumers pay the tariffs, in effect, as sales taxes, an increase in tariffs means an increase in prices through, in effect, sales taxes which is the very definition of inflation, that increase in prices that Donald Trump's tariffs would bring about. Donald Trump is proposing the single most inflationary idea of our lifetimes. And that is just one aspect of the pain Donald Trump would inflict with this idea, which Harvard economist Lawrence Summers who was the first to raise concerns about possible inflation during the COVID-19 pandemic, says is the worst economic policy proposal in U.S. history. In U.S. history. And Larry Summers knows economic U.S. history. And that means that Donald Trump's idea is worse than smoot Holly, much worse. Replacing the income tax with uh, revenue with tariff would be the worst macroeconomic policy proposal in uh, U.S. history. It, of course, burdens the middle class and uh, the poor who 
purchase goods we uh, goods that exist on international markets. So it's regressive, as many economic commentators have suggested. But that is actually the least of it. Think about it this way. The Smoot-Hawley tariffs, which did enormous damage, some people would say made the Depression great, were six-tenths of one percent of GDP. If you replaced half of income tax revenues, not all like he talked about, if you replaced half of income uh, tax revenues with uh, tariffs, those would be tax, those would be tariffs six times uh, Smoot Hawley uh, levels. That's got the potential to do enormous damage to the competitiveness of every U.S. exporter, to do huge damage to uh, all kinds of workers who use imported goods in what their businesses uh, produce, to create a downward spiral as much higher prices for everything we import means consumers have less to spend on uh, everything uh, else, create worldwide economic war warfare as the rest of the world uh, responds. This is a prescription for uh, the mother of uh, all stagflations. Uh, stagflation is a not so easily achieved economic condition of stagnant economic growth, no economic growth combined with high inflation and high unemployment all at the same time. We have not seen stagflation in this country in the 21st century. But Donald Trump is now running to make stagflation great again. Leading off our discussion tonight is Robert Reich, who served as Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton. He is a professor of public policy at UC Berkeley and co-founder of inequality media. Professor Reich, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I, I know you have much to say about uh, Trump economic policies, but I just want to do a quick back of the envelope uh, sketch here, because I know for some people out there, they're hearing, what? Get rid of the income tax? I'd be better off. And it's like, well, OK, L let's say you're making $100,000. You're in the 22 percent income tax bracket. Uh, you're going to have sales taxes on a lot of things that would be up, in, sales taxes through tariffs in effect, that could approach 20% or above. Uh, you could have interest rates on home mortgages that go way up into the double digits, and all sorts of other ways in which you are economically much worse off under this sales tax tariff regime than you would be under an in income tax regime. And oh, by the way, when you lose your job because of all of this, your tax bracket actually goes to zero. Uh, <laughs> Lawrence, uh, you know, we have come to have such low expectations in terms of the coherence and rationality of Donald Trump that these kinds of proposals can very easily get under the radar. People say, mm -hmm. well, he's just mouthing off again. The fact of the matter is, this is serious. This is, he doesn't put forth many serious proposals. This one seems to be serious because he does say it in a way that makes you think, well, uh, the, the income tax, getting rid of the income tax might be a pretty good idea until you actually think about the consequences. In order to have enough revenue from tariffs, to match what you would lose by getting rid of the income tax, you would have to have a tariff that was at least in the range of 130 to 140 percent. I know th th this is be way beyond smooth hall. I mean, this, <laughs> yeah. this, this takes us into onto another planet because with that kind of a tariff, that's like a, the largest sales tax you could mm -hmm. conceive of. That would bring the economy to not only stagflation, but probably much worse. Yeah, that $30,000 car you have your eye on becomes a $60,000 car, and there's nothing uh, about ha having your income tax reduced that makes that more affordable uh, for you. Uh, uh, Professor Reich, there's, there's more to the try. Even before he got to this utter 
madness of let's just finance the government uh, through tariffs. Uh, there's so much more about what he's been saying about economic policy that you have been taking apart uh, in your way. Uh, take us through some of that. Well, I mean, he's talked about exerting control over the Federal Reserve Board, uh, which would basically eliminate the credibility of the Fed in terms of the Fed setting interest rates. Uh, he's talked about rounding up 11 million or 15 million people who are in the United States who are undocumented, which would, will, would have drastic effects on our labor market, not in a positive way, because we need those people. If you look at what they do and how much revenue they actually bring in, he is talking about reducing taxes on the highest income earners, and we're talking about all sorts of taxes, uh, and what's the effect there? Remember, in his term of office as president, he told us that he would cut the taxes on the rich and on big corporations, and we would all, all of us, get a $4,000 bonus as it trickled down to everybody else. Well, did you get a bonus? Did anybody you know get a bonus? Uh, we could go on and on. Uh, this is the most ridiculous, to call it a plan, dignifies it. And and that then there's the other elements, which are economic elements, uh, for example, re, just getting rid of Obamacare. Uh, that's an incredible economic hit, never mind the, the health conditions that could be affected by it, but the actual economic life of people who depend on Obamacare, who cannot possibly afford health insurance without it. Well, the interesting thing, Lawrence, is we are having a substantive discussion right now. We're talking about real people, real policies, real laws, real economics. And Donald Trump doesn't live in this realm. He throws things out there uh, and he says, yes, I'm going to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Yes, I'm going to give uh, the oil and gas industry free reign to do whatever they want to do, as long as, by the way, they give me a billion dollars my, for my campaign. Uh, I'm going to basically wreck the economy with the Smoot-Hawley, uh, kind of the, the, the most egregious form of Smoot-Hawley on steroids you could imagine. Uh, and 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 people are not putting this together, and they're not seeing the disaster for what this actually is. I mean, yes, all of all the things he said about the democracy, about our democracy, are bad enough. But wrecking, taking a wrecking ball to our economy, and really imposing extraordinary costs uh, and hardship on so many working class, middle class, and poor people, well, I, 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 it's, it's hard to find the words, quite frankly. Uh, well, Henry Ford's word for it was an economic stupidity. Professor Robert Reich, thank you very much for starting off our discussions tonight. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. And coming up, you might notice that this program is concentrating as much on Senate elections as on the presidential election. We will be joined later in this hour by someone who knows more about the United States Senate than I ever will. Ira Shapiro has worked in the Senate and written about the Senate for 50 years and will explain the importance once again of the Senate no matter who is president. And next, we will be joined by the Democratic Senate candidate in Texas running against Republican Senator Cruz. Congressman Colin Allred joins us next. I was at risk of organ damage to my kidneys and brain, but I still wasn't dead enough for an exception for the abortion care in Texas. That is Texas mother of two, Lauren Miller, who joined us on this program recently. She was testifying there to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Lauren Miller is one of the 30 million Texans who Republican Senator Rafael Edward Cruz is supposed to represent. Senator Cruz, who is on that subcommittee, couldn't even be bothered to show up. He either simply was too much of a coward to face the situation that he had forced me into, or he just didn't care. Texas Congressman Colin Allred, who is now running for Senate against Senator Cruz, met with Lauren Miller before that hearing, and he heard what Senator Cruz did not want to hear, that 
Lauren Miller traveled over 700 miles to Colorado to get the life-saving medical treatment that she was denied by the Republican government of Texas. There are several Texas cities now trying to pass abortion travel bans that make it illegal to use local roads and highways to help a person access an abortion outside of Texas. Congressman Allred, who will join us in a moment, heard all of that today from the Amarillo Reproductive Freedom Alliance. The group successfully defeated a petition in the city of Amarillo that would have adopted an abortion travel ban there. Here's what Congressman Allred had to say. We don't have to be embarrassed by our senator. We can get a new one. And that's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. It's about the woman in the pan the women in the panhandle standing up to billionaires who want to ban travel on local roads to access an abortion. And they're winning, by the way. And it's about the mother of two who has a much wanted and much prayed for third pregnancy and who gets the news that we all hope we don't get. The pregnancy is not viable. The baby's not going to make it. And she now has to make one of the most heartbreaking decisions that any person will ever be faced with. And because of extremists like Ted Cruz, she can't get the care that she needs close to home. So she has to flee our state under threat of criminal prosecution. That's not my Texas. In my Texas, we believe in freedom. We believe in the freedom to make your own health care decisions, including access to an abortion. Joining us now, Democratic Congressman from Texas, Colin Allred. He is a Democratic nominee running for the United States Senate in Texas against Senator Cruz. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, you are part of our campaign here to convince uh, viewers and voters to understand the importance of the Senate uh, in our election, no matter who wins the presidency. Uh, it's incredibly important either way. Uh, but what, you're also, what we're also seeing here uh, is that for the people of Texas, Ted Cruz does not seem to believe that he represents all of them. He certainly doesn't rep represent women who come to testify to him about right, the Lawrence. struggles that he has imposed yeah. on them. That's right. And thank you for having me on. And you know, happy Juneteenth. It was a Texas holiday. Now it's a federal holiday. Uh, but, you know, listen, Lauren Miller is an eighth generation Texan. Uh, and she lives in my district. She lives not far from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and she came to uh, the Senate to tell her story. And just like with Amanda Zorowski, who we talked about a few months back, Lawrence, uh, Ted Cruz, who's on that committee, uh, refused uh, to hear her out, wouldn't even show her the basic respect of just sitting in the seat and hearing her tell her story. Uh, because as you said, I don't think Ted Cruz does see himself as representing all 30 million of us as Texans, and he certainly doesn't want to take responsibility uh, for the fact that his extreme policies, that this is the this is the end point of it, that this is what it looks like when you pass an extreme abortion ban. And then you also have you know, municipalities trying to say that folks can't travel through that municipality. This is what it looks like. It's, it's a mother uh, who gets the news that we all hope we don't get, that when she's hoping to welcome twins, that one of those babies is not going to make it. And it's killing her and the other one. Uh, and instead of being able to get a 15-minute procedure close to home, she has to go to Colorado, an eighth-generation Texan. And that's not who we are as Texans, and that's why on November 5th, we're going to get rid of Ted Cruz. You know, the last time we had a travel ban in this country, it was a travel ban on the free movement of enslaved people to move both uh, out of a state and across these states. Uh, as you said, uh, Juneteenth today originated... Uh, in Texas, what does it feel like to be in Texas for peop the people of Texas on this day? Well, you know, Juneteenth is a uh, Texas holiday that I've celebrated my entire life, and I'm I'm, I'm so glad that now the entire country uh, is getting a chance to celebrate it. I think it's about freedom, but I also think it's a chance to recommit ourselves uh, to the promise of our founding documents, to recommit ourselves to the ideas that we haven't really ever fully completed, but that we've been working towards, and we're trying to perfect our union. And that's what I think we've been talking about here today in Dallas. We had a great uh, march with Dr. Obel Lee, uh, who uh, is the uh, godmother or grandmother of Juneteenth. She's a, a wonderful person. Uh, and this, I think, does cross over into reproductive freedom and into the ability to make your own health care decisions and the ability to make uh, your own decisions about your life. Uh, and that so much of that is at risk here in Texas. 
And if folks think that it won't come to you if you're not in Texas, let's be very clear. If Ted Cruz gets a chance, he will pass a nationwide ban on abortion and enforce what's happening to Texas women onto women all over this country. And we can't let it happen. It's not who we are as Texans, it's not who we are as Americans. And so I need folks to go to callinallred.com and help us make sure that we can stand up for who we really are. I mean, you know with the Republicans uh, that you're working with in the House of Representatives that there is very strong support, especially among the, with the Speaker of the House, current Speaker of the House, to pass a national abortion ban. The current Speaker of the House, I'm sure, lives for nothing more uh, than that, wants nothing more than that. Uh, with a Republican Senate, they could do that. That's right. And... You know, they wouldn't stop there. We've seen them talking about, uh, you know, IVF, of course, and when you support these you know, fetal personhood laws, which our speaker has supported, he's a, a co-sponsor of that legislation, which Ted Cruz supported when he was running for president back in 2016, You mean that means that IVF uh, is no longer something that's going to be legal. Uh, they are openly talking about birth control. I mean, it's hard to even imagine that in 2024, uh, we're talking about this. But we've seen this before. We've seen this before where they start talking about something that seems extreme. And it seems like it'll never happen. And then a few decades later, they actually do it. That's what we saw with Roe. Uh, and now they're, they're, they're aiming their sights at other uh, of our freedoms. Uh, and we can't let it happen. And I, I just know that we're not going to. Uh, and that's, I think, the good news for folks uh, that I want them to know about us here in Texas, is that folks are you know, standing up. Uh, they know that's not who we are. They know that we have to fight back against this. Uh, and I know all across the country, uh, the, uh, the biggest coalition that we have is a pro-democracy, pro-freedom coalition, one that fundamentally understands that those freedoms are at risk. I think that's the one uh, that we're going to see come out on November 5th. Congressman Colin Allred, now running for Senate in Texas against Senator Cruz. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Lawrence. And coming up, Vladimir Putin's excellent adventure in North Korea today produced an agreement not worth the paper it was written on, which, of course, was not made public. The desperation of Vladimir Putin is next. Vladimir Putin proved today just how much Russia is not winning his war against Ukraine and what an outcast Vladimir Putin has become in the world. The Russian president went to the place no one else wants to go and everyone living there wants to escape, North Korea. Vladimir Putin has been reduced to the status of a beggar in the presence of a dictator even crazier than Vladimir Putin. North Korea's Kim Jong-un welcomed Vladimir Putin to North Korea yesterday. North Korea is literally having trouble keeping the lights on in its desperation for fuel to run the country's primitive power plants. Kim called Putin, quote, the dearest friend of the Korean people. It sounds like Kim has already forgotten this guy. I got a very beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un. He really wrote a beautiful three-page, I mean, right from top to bottom, a really beautiful letter. We fell in love, okay? No, really. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. It is no longer easy to say that Kim Jong-un is crazier than Vladimir Putin, because at least Kim Jong-un has not launched a war that North Korea cannot win against South Korea. Today, Kim and Putin tried their best imitation of serious world leaders by signing an agreement that they claim is a pledge for each country to assist the other in the event of aggression from another country. According to the New York Times translation, Vladimir Putin said, this is a truly breakthrough document reflecting the desire of the two countries not to rest on their laurels. Good idea for two countries that don't have any laurels to rest on. The document is, of course, a fraud, and no copy of it will be released publicly. When historians finally get their hands on it, possibly decades from now, it will no doubt be seen to be nothing and mean nothing. And in the meantime, what everyone in the world knows, including Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, is neither one of them can be trusted in any situation to do anything, no matter what piece of paper they might have signed today. Just remember, anyone in the news media who is describing this deal to you has not seen a single word of the deal. And many of them 
are making the mistake of believing that it is actually possible to make a binding deal with either Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-un. Nothing happened today. There's nothing on that piece of paper that means anything. North Korea does appear to have agreed to sell more arms to Russia, which only highlights Russia's desperate inability to continue to supply the Russian military. Joining us now is Richard Stengel, who served as Undersecretary of State in the Obama administration. He is an MSNBC political analyst, and he is the author of Information Wars, How We Lost the Global Battle Against Disinformation and What We Can Do About It. Uh, Rick, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, this seems to be uh, a meeting of the most exa of, of exaggerated importance uh, exclusively by the news media, if you take in certain views of it. But why would he, neither one of these guys believes the other guy means a thing that the other guy says, right? I mean, this is a, a meaningless exchange between these two. Yes, they're both, as you put it, Lawrence, they're authoritarian pariahs on the world stage. They come from the two most sanctioned nations in the world. They are probably the two most sanctioned leaders in the world. It's a pact of desperation. And as you said, you know, Vladimir Putin, the head of what was formerly a superpower, going fur hat in hand uh, to North Korea to get artillery shells for his war in Ukraine, is a huge come down. As you say, nobody goes to North Korea, uh, but he had to go to North Korea. And, you know, we're looking at a world where, and I'm sorry to go straight to it, but you did it in your introduction, a world where if Donald Trump is elected, these two pariah nations will go from being excluded from the family of nations to being included in the family mm -hmm. of nations. They'll be exchanging love letters. And this is not something that's good for the United States. It's not good for uh, our children or our children's children, and that's what we're looking at. Yeah, I mean, there is a terrible turn of history here, but it happened a while ago. It was uh, Vladimir Putin, we thought, sometimes, used to try to be helpful. Uh, American, uh, American diplomats would uh, ask the Russians to help coax North Korea into a more reasonable position on certain things, try to inch them one way or the other. That's gone. There's absolutely no possibility of ever uh, asking Vladimir Putin to do that again. It was never clear how much Putin was actually able to do when we were asking him to do that. You know, Lawrence, for a decade, he was for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. He voted for that in the Security Council. He voted for that in the UN. He doesn't want nuclear weapons near him or on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is right beside him. So uh, he's so desperate to get arms for this illegal, obscene war in Ukraine that he's going back on a policy that actually jeopardizes Russia. Uh, that's how desperate he is. And it's too bad because, you know, we often used to do things with Russia that were in our mutual interest. And now Putin is only doing what is in his interest, which is not in the interest of anybody else in the world at all. Richard Stengel, thank you very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Coming up. Ira Shapiro worked in the Senate longer than I did, and he has thought and written more wisely about the Senate than I have. He will join us next to consider the stakes in this year's important Senate elections. The Biden presidential campaign will be devoting a massive amount of campaign resources to targeting voters who are the most difficult to reach. And what makes those voters difficult to reach is their disinterest in the presidential campaign. It's much easier to sell a new car to someone who wants to buy a new car than someone who hasn't even thought about buying a new car. Same with presidential candidates. So the Biden campaign is going to have to convince millions of voters who don't think they have anything at stake in the presidential campaign or don't like either one of the candidates to understand what's at stake and to vote for Joe Biden. There will be no comparable national effort made with those same voters to make them understand what is at stake in the next line on their ballots, which will be their votes for United States senators. In his book about the Senate, now out in a new paperback edition called The Betrayal, 
how Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans abandoned America. Ira Shapiro, who knows more about the Senate than I ever will, writes, I believe that Trump's presidency was an unmitigated disaster for America with continuing repercussions that inflicted grave damage on our country with echoes all over the world. I stand by my view that he will go down as the most reviled American president in our history. But in our system, no one man or woman, even the president, is supposed to be able to destabilize our democracy. For that reason, I contended that the responsibility for the catastrophic failure of government resided with the Senate, specifically with Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans. It was the Senate's role to stop a president who was threatening our constitutional democracy and the polarized, degraded Senate knowingly and repeatedly failed to do so, even after Trump instigated the January 6th attack on the Capitol in his indefensible effort to remain in power after losing the 2020 election to Joe Biden. Joining our discussion now is Irish Shapiro, who served for over a decade in senior staff positions in the United States Senate and served in the Clinton administration. Ira, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we, we meet in this subject, on this subject, in sadness, because we are always, uh, it might not be fully apparent to others, but mourning what the Senate used to be, the Senate that we lost, where uh, we could easily respect the positions of Republicans who were opposed to our views and legislative engagement on the Senate floor and sometimes come out with a compromise solution, sometimes not, uh, but never think that we were up against a force that was trying to either destroy the Senate uh, or harm the country in any way. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for having me. And of course, you and I go back in the Senate and we look at the Senate and the long decline of it with sadness. On the other hand, I was interested in updating the book to find that in 2022, for instance, the Senate actually came up with quite a few bipartisan accomplishments. President Biden and Senate Leader Schumer unified the Democrats for the most part, and then were able to find a dozen or 15 Republicans for the first gun safety legislation in a long time, the Marriage Equality Act, the Chips and Science Act. I think the Republicans, to some extent, wanted to make up for their catastrophic failure in failing to stop Donald Trump. So the Senate with democratic leadership and control can actually accomplish some things, which makes this election cycle so critically important to keep the Senate majority, which is now hanging by a thread. Yeah, and that, so that's what's at stake in any, every one of these elections, whether, uh, you know, you might not think your particular Senate race in your state matters very much to you, but control of the Senate, who's going to be the chairman, who's going to run these committees, who's going to be in control of the way it works, which party, uh, that's just night and day. You know, it wasn't, wasn't always that way. Mm -hmm. We had shifts in the Senate, if you go back in 1980 or 86, Control shifted, and yet the Senate tended to function either way, because the senators had a concept of what the Senate was about. They knew how to do the business of the Senate. But as we've become a more polarized country, and in recent years, the control of the Senate is an absolutely critical imperative. We had the Biden administration and the Schumer majority Senate, which contrasted so dramatically from the McConnell-controlled Senate, which failed the country and gave us the extreme Supreme Court majority that has imperiled our rights uh, in a, on a continuing basis. You, uh, you have a quote uh, that I had actually forgotten uh, in this edition uh, from Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who I worked for, uh, where he makes the point that he said, uh, in the next century, America is going to have to consider uh, how the representation 
uh, pattern in the Senate, the two per state, and how that has turned out in a way that the founders could not have imagined with a state the size of California having two and one of the, each Dakota having two. Uh, and so that people are wildly overrepresented in the Senate uh, from some states, wildly underrepresented in the Senate from other states. Uh, as such that now uh, you pointed out that, uh, that, that that there's about nine states where you have almost a majority of the country uh, represented by only 18 senators. It's the Senate's legitimacy uh, hangs on that. Uh, the notion that California has only two uh, two senators, when Wyoming has two senators. Uh, offends our concept, and yet it's baked into the Constitution. What was the solution to that in practical terms? In practical terms, it was that so many excellent senators came from small states, mm -hmm. and they proved to be, whether it was South Dakota mm -hmm. or Vermont, all over the country, small state senators, Montana, like Mike Mansfield, proved to be great senators. And as a consequence, the Senate operated, and we weren't so conscious of the, of the disparities in population. But when the Senate breaks down, then the inequity of California having two senators and as opposed to Wyoming having two, that's striking to us. And uh, as, and you have a proposal in the book for having at-large senators, uh, a, a group of senators, 15 maybe, who are elected nationally. Well, that is, a, that is my, my idea, um, and I'd like people to think about it at some point. Fundamental change in the Senate is probably years off. But I thought if you elected 15 senators nationally, these national senators would have a different sense of their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. They would upgrade the Senate overall. And I think they would encourage the other hundred senators to think about their commitments to the national interest, as opposed to simply being representatives of their state or party members. Um, the Senate's deteriorated quite a bit because the senators have become fundamentally partisan operatives. Many of the Republican senators particularly became partisan operatives as opposed to people who were looking at the national interests. When we get to the other side of this election, we have to talk about Ira Shapiro's uh, reform of the Senate ideas. Uh, the book is The Betrayal, How Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans Abandoned America. Ira Shapiro, thank you very much for joining us once again tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Good to be with you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Senate expert Ira Shapiro gets tonight's last word.